Thanks for coming to Data Day. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to data services and, and where we see things going at NERSC. Um, so NERSC has a, a huge number of data services that it supports. Uh, these are across uh, you know, all different areas from data transfer to data management to visualization to containers and data analytics. Um, so one way of kind of representing this uh, that I produced for a blog a few years back is, uh, you know, kind of in this way, and I know it's kind of more complex than this, but there's, you know, need to get data from scientific instruments, uh, store it on big file systems, interact with that in an efficient manner, steer workflows either interactively or via workflow managers. Uh, and this interfaces with services that might be standalone databases, or they might be in you know, a more flexible service platform. Uh, and then you need to interact with uh, HPC system. Uh, and there's all kinds of uh, policy and also technology needed to, to make that efficient. Uh, so including things like containerization technology, uh, and then actually producing results uh, is also a kind of data problem. So there's analytics tools, uh, an increasing amount of machine learning tools, uh, and visualization. And all of this is an ever-changing ecosystem. So if you actually look at the blog, uh, I've updated many of these uh, entries, uh, but a lot of the picture is static, but some of it is very quickly changing. So I thought it was interesting to look back at one previous day today. Uh, so in, in those days, we had less technical problems because most people were in building 50 auditorium <laughs> in person. Um, but many things, other things have changed as well in this time. Um, so I thought it was interesting to look at this machine learning talk here and who even remembers what the Zan one was? <laughs> well, well named deep learning framework, but not, not that long lived. Um, so, you know, TensorFlow was just kind of starting then and then turned out to dominate and even PyTorch didn't even exist at that time. And um, so you'll see now it's kind of rapidly growing. So things have certainly changed since then. So this plot only starts from 2018. So 2016 was even further back. So there was probably less than 100 users of Jupyter now and uh, then. So now there's over uh, you know, several thousand. And in fact, we can see from daily usage that it's actually more popular as an interface into our systems than SSH. Python also is rapidly growing. Now, basically, everybody uses Python, I think you can say, to first approximation. And not even that, but it's also used this kind of numbers about what batch jobs use Python in some way. And that's also a large fraction of the jobs that we're running. Um, with deep learning, the, we saw a growth in just three years of 6x. Uh, and as I mentioned before, PyTorch wasn't even on our radar in 2017, for example, and it's now pretty much overtaken TensorFlow. I mean, this is last year's plot, but it's now overtaken. Uh, and then containers, we also see a similar growth, hundreds of users, but it, perhaps even more impressively, uh, the top 500 result that uh, Perlmutter submitted and uh, put it at number five was in fact run inside a shipper container. So these technologies really are not, uh, no, rapidly become part of the mainstream. Um, so here's kind of just an overall picture of where we are, and we see these big numbers for Python at 3,600 users and uh, these growing ones for deep learning frameworks. But we also see emerging technologies like Julia and, uh, and others that are just kind of already starting this growth. Um, so all of these services run on our big supercomputers, you know, that's the, the essential uh, or, or interface with our supercomputers. So that's the core of what we do at NERSC. Uh, and you've probably seen various presentations on this, but just in case you haven't, uh, you know, Perlmutter is most of the compute power is centered in these GPU nodes um, that are NVIDIA A100 accelerated. And this is a great resource for deep learning, for example. Um, but then there's also a large number of CPU nodes, which can be used for the more traditional analytics of um, experiment workflows or things that are difficult to, or, or impractical to GPU. Uh, but then I like this slide as well because it also shows that there's significant other infrastructure on the system that's important to data analytics, such as the all-flash file system, 
and the fast connections out to external facilities and to uh, larger file systems than this. Um, and across these systems, data services interact. And so this uh, shows, as I mentioned, that data comes in from outside, runs potentially on CPU nodes and on GPU nodes, uh, interacts with the file system, and this can all be driven by workflow integration. Uh, and I just wanted to comment here that, you know, we're really at the start of Perlmutter and we're going to be seeing increasing data capabilities integrated into Perlmutter. And this is particularly true for like workflow integration, where we expect to be able to bring containerized uh, services closer into the system. Okay, so this was already planned kind of in the NURSE 9 review period. Um, but for NURSE 10, we're just starting this planning now and it's going to be even more workflow and data uh, capable. Uh, and so this is kind of the just overview slide of what we're talking about with NURSE 10, which shows firstly that it extends out into the system, but also, I mean, out, out into uh, ESNet and out to instruments, uh, but also that it will have workflow services built into that. Okay, so as I pointed out, things have moved on. Uh, so we now have all of these great data transfer tools, we have IO libraries, we have performant file systems, we have these uh, flexible Python based frameworks that allow really sophisticated tools to be kind of at the fingertips uh, and containerized services that enable complex stacks to be there and also for this to be portable on different systems. Um, and we have all these tools for building services uh, that sit, for example, on the side of the machine and drive things. Um, but uh, you know, there's remaining challenges. And I, I outlined kind of some of this direction in uh, a talk that's linked here, a, a longer seminar. Uh, and this wasn't necessarily coordinated, but I think uh, some of the talks that we're talking about in this meeting actually touch on many of these aspects of these challenges. Uh, so one important area is IO, where data volumes are still increasing larger than, uh, faster than IO can, uh, keep up with. Uh, and this both means, I think, that we need developments in kind of the, the way that we store data and the way that we do processing on storage. So that, those are research aspects that I know uh, jean Luca works on as well. But uh, another important area is actually just improving the IO that we do. And IO profiling uh, is an important piece of that that we'll hear about soon. Um, and then uh, this area of workflow services and bringing them into HPC systems. And so we've got a bunch of talks about uh, how that can be done with our spin service um, and uh, with workflow managers running close to the HPC system uh, and using enough APIs to do that. Um, and then about using these productive languages, I mentioned Python libraries are pretty capable, but also using them with large scale uh, compute is not a solved problem, uh, but there's various directions that can help with that that we'll hear about. Uh, and then, you know, maybe Python isn't the right language, as Johannes will probably tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Julia is the way to get performance and uh, productivity. Um, it's up to him to convince us of that. <laughs> Uh, and then I mentioned here alongside this containers, uh, you know, there's many advantages of containers, but one of them is actually also to help with scaling of these um, uh, tools to, to HPC systems. Uh, and then in terms of deep learning and analytics, um, you know, there's, uh, again, tool, uh, you know, help needed in, in getting these to run and distributed on large systems, uh, and it can require uh, tuning. So we're going to hear about that and with some, uh, you know, demos on how to achieve this from Steve. Um, and then there's also this kind of emerging tool, I guess, JAX, which not only uh, kind of helps to address the, the kind of question of uh, scaling um, Python onto, onto GPUs, uh, but also I think an important part of this is it brings potentially auto differentiation to uh, software written in JAX, and this I think is this towards this last point about adding, uh, you know, direct inference by, uh, on experimental data by interfacing simulation with differentiation. Okay, so we've got an exciting agenda. Uh, obviously, we had a st somewhat stunted start here with the AV problems, uh, but 
uh, it definitely there's a lot to lot to come here. So um, stay tuned for it all.